He sat among them and dined together. He looked at them with full love, each one individually. Then he told them what would happen. Tonight, from the heart of this intimate gathering, there will be a departure. One of you will betray me, and soon you will not see me. Then, after dinner, he poured water into a basin and wrapped a towel around his waist. He began to wash their feet and dry them with the towel that he was wearing. Then he instructed them, saying, If you call me teacher and lord and I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet and serve one another and love one another with the love with which I have loved you. And let this love unite you to be one. By this the world will know that you are my disciples, And in the garden after dinner, Jesus was praying while the disciples slept. Judas came with many. Who were eager to erase his existence. For he shook their thrones with his teachings. And broke the chains of those they had bound. The teacher looked at them and asked, whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth? I am he. Let these men go. The disciples all fled, frightened and terrified, leaving the teacher knowing what awaited him, and only his spilled blood would quench their flame. They found no fault in him, how could they, when he went about doing good? But they tortured him severely. Then they nailed him to the cross for hours, struggling, until he gave up his spirit, forgiving those who crucified him and all who opposed him. The disciples returned to the upper room, extremely fearful for their lives. For the Jews might seek them, and their fate would be like their teachers. They locked their doors and stayed together. The teacher died and left them nothing written, but he returned to them, risen and triumphant, breaking through their locked doors. And gave them strength so they no longer thought about how to preserve their lives, but how to give them in love for others. And they opened their doors and went out to announce the joy. And they were announcing the good news that Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead. And they were adding to the church those who accepted Jesus as Lord and Teacher. The disciples were gathering in the temple of Jerusalem for prayer and worship. But the Jews rejected them, cast them out, persecuted them, and killed James, the brother of the Lord. So they fled from Jerusalem. But there was someone who wanted to erase the memory of this name, Jesus of Nazareth. It was Saul of Tarsus, who went after them to Damascus. But on the way he saw a great light and fell from his horse, and heard Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul went to Damascus, not as a persecutor, but as a seeker to join the community of Jesus. And Saul followed Jesus with all his heart and went about preaching him to all nations.
Paul suffered much on his three missionary journeys, founding churches while present and writing letters while afar, even writing letters while imprisoned. Paul took many with him on his missionary journeys. Luke the physician and painter, Silas, Timothy, Titus and the couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Paul was a Roman and a Jew, spoke several languages, knew the Holy Scriptures, having been a disciple of Gamaliel, one of the most famous Jewish scholars of his time. Paul, who sought to erase the name of Jesus of Nazareth, is the same one who wrote that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Paul was martyred in the reign of Emperor Nero around 65 AD in Rome. Beheaded, and his faith's fountain never dried. As for the apostles, those who were once fearful and terrified went out to preach. Peter preached in Antioch, then Rome, and stayed there until he was crucified. Thomas went to India. He preached and was martyred there, killed by a spear. Andrew went to Asia Minor, then Greece, where he was crucified. James preached in Spain, then returned to Jerusalem, where he was beheaded. Philip preached in Phrygia, Asia Minor. Jude Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot preached in Persia. Bartholomew preached in Armenia. Matthias preached in the Caucasus. Mark preached in Egypt and was martyred there. How did the apostles preach? The emerging Christian communities were very passionate about Jesus. So they bombarded the apostles who lived with Jesus with questions. And the apostles would bring Jesus alive in their memories and remember everything he said and did. They remembered what Mary, the mother of Jesus, and James, the brother of the Lord, told them. The apostles told communities how Jesus went about preaching and doing good and calling the tax collectors and eating with the outcasts and those called sinners and affirming that the Father desires mercy, not sacrifice, and spending his nights in prayer and by his deeds and healings, affirmed that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, and freed many from the traditions of the elders and removed fear from their hearts, and how the chief priests plotted against him and decided to get rid of him. And they also answered their life questions about paying taxes, marriage and divorce, forgiveness and pardon, what defiles a person, how to inherit eternal life and God's care for his creation. The apostles strove to teach the Christian communities Jesus' philosophy instructing them during the breaking of bread ceremonies, reminding them that Jesus' words are spirit and life. These parables, sayings and actions used by the apostles to answer believers' questions became widely shared among them, solidifying Jesus' philosophy and making each of them a living gospel. All these answers coming from the events of Jesus' life were not presented by the apostles in their historical context, but within the framework of responding to believers' inquiries and reinforcing Jesus' philosophy in them. This oral tradition was sufficient for the communities to grow in Jesus' philosophy and to solidify his nature within them, living as lambs and doves despite the bloody persecutions and brutal torments that befell them, staying true to Jesus' teachings, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and pray for all who mistreat you.
As the original apostles and eyewitnesses began to disappear, some felt the necessity to record what was being circulated among Christians in communities stretching from Italy to Syria, Turkey, Greece, Egypt and Palestine. The first gospel appeared in Rome, written in Greek and attributed to Mark, Peter's disciple, who arranged these stories, sayings and parables either individually or in units within the life of Jesus from baptism to resurrection, ending with the 16th chapter, verse 8, where it narrates that the women fled from the tomb in terror and amazement, and out of fear they told no one. Later, verses 9 to 20 were added, highlighting that Jesus is the Messiah or Christ, the awaited King for the salvation of Israel and the world, emphasizing that it was necessary for him to suffer and die to enter into his glory and resurrection. The second gospel appeared in Syria, Palestine, and seems to have had access to Mark's gospel. It includes most of the parables, teachings and sayings found in the second gospel, but in a more comprehensive manner and with a different arrangement of events and the slight variations in details. This gospel is attributed to Matthew the Apostle and is targeted at Jews, hence it frequently quotes the Old Testament. Matthew's gospel presents Jesus as fulfilling the prophecies, covering his birth, crucifixion, death and resurrection. What distinguishes this gospel is the Sermon on the Mount containing Jesus' deepest teachings. The Gospel, usually attributed to Luke, who accompanied Paul, is written in a refined Greek language, endeavoring to narrate events and matters accurately, acknowledging that many have attempted to arrange the received traditions from eyewitnesses like the Apostles. This indicates they were receiving events unordered and spontaneously. Hence, there was an effort to organize these events. This gospel is attributed to Luke. Luke, not being an eyewitness to Jesus' life, gathered information from those who were and from other primary sources. Luke's gospel shows attention to historical and geographical details and highlights Jesus' compassion towards the poor women and the marginalized. It's also known for its focus on prayer and the Holy Spirit. Another gospel appears in Ephesus, Turkey, markedly different in composition from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, emphasizing Jesus' divine nature. It seeks to portray Jesus as the Word made flesh, stressing, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. This gospel is attributed to John the Apostle, However, scholarly developments have led some to question whether John himself wrote it or if it was the product of a community of believers associated with John rather than a single author. The first three Gospels, despite their similarities, each one presents details and events slightly differently. Each Gospel came from the collective reflection of a Christian community that had been nurtured on the Apostles' teaching for years. For example, when Jesus fed the crowds with five loaves and two fish, in Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he led their sick. In Mark 6.34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. In Luke 9.11, But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who had need of healing. Thus each apostle used the same event, to answer a question from the community, passionately curious about Jesus and to teach them Jesus' philosophy. 
Jesus is the one who sees the lost crowds like sheep without a shepherd, feels compassion for them, teaches them because this teaching is the light that shows them the way, so they are no longer lost. In Matthew where he heals the sick, or in Luke where he heals all who were in need of healing, this miracle is presented in a specific sequence and place within each gospel. Matthew's account of the miracle in chapter 14 verses 13 to 21 immediately follows the news of John the Baptist's death. In Mark's gospel, the miracle is recorded in chapter 6 verses 30 to 44, following the apostles' return from their mission of preaching and healing. Luke narrates the miracle in chapter 9, verses 10 to 17, also after the apostles return from spreading the good news and performing healings, presented in the context of Jesus sending out the apostles. John's account is found in chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, presenting the miracle before Jesus walks on water and followed by a dialogue about Jesus being the bread of life. The Gospels are spontaneous preachings of the Apostles, told in a spontaneous narrative framework about Jesus' life to Christian communities deeply in love with Jesus. They also serve as answers to their questions, with the aim of teaching them Jesus' philosophy and embedding Jesus' spirit within them. Later, these communities orally circulated the Gospel for three to four decades without the need for writing them down. When the Gospels were eventually written, they were penned in Greek, not Jesus' native Aramaic, and in locations far from where the events occurred, at different times and to a varied audience, either Jews or Gentiles. Thus the Gospels came to be both similar and different. The objective wasn't to provide a chronological or even a verbatim recount of Jesus' sayings, but rather to teach those wishing to follow Jesus, the philosophy and heart of Jesus, to think and interact as Jesus did, the Lamb who offered himself as a sacrifice for his teachings and as a ransom for the freedom of those he liberated from the dominance of those who used religion to enslave the thoughts of the simple. And to transform the world into one large family, the family of the Heavenly Father, who created and fashioned us to enjoy his love. And these Gospels, despite their simplicity and differences, present what Jesus planted in. The history of humanity is a tree of love in place of that old tree. But this tree, whoever eats from its fruits, becomes a beacon of light, leading people to those joyful meadows created by the Creator for our joy and delight.